Apogee is back. Is the world ready for a new Commander Keen? More about this and other stories on This Week in Retro. High resolution color graphics. This land of high technology. The revolution in technology that made the information age possible. Those kids are not afraid of computers. Online potatoes. Apogee returns. Super sized Nintendo. A new retro arcade to open in Milton Keynes. All this, plus our community question of the week on This Week in Retro. Up to date news for out of date tech. I know, John, that you are a huge fan of Japan and their massive contribution to gaming, as am I, but I've never had the pleasure of visiting. I know you've been over there on more than one occasion, is that right? Yeah, I've so been over there a couple of times. Mm hmm. Yeah, so I've never actually had the pleasure of visiting, but I'm told the place to go and pick up retro bargains is Super Potato. There are, I think, over 10 stores, but the big one, uh, the, the place where everyone tries to make the pilgrimage to, is the three-floor store in Akihabara. Am I saying that right? Akihabara. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's pretty close. Close enough. Yeah. Um, I, and you, you've been there, haven't you, John? To, to this, I have. Have you been to this particular store? I've been to the one in Akihabara, for sure. Uh, yeah. That was the... I've been there. It was glorious. Back in 2008, I went to visit my friend Dan, who was stationed with the Navy over in Japan, and we made the pilgrimage to all of the sites worth seeing in the country. I mean, we went to the Big Buddha in Kamakura. We went to multiple hard-off, book-off locations. But most importantly, to Super Potato. Never before have I seen such splendor, such grandeur. Neil, there was a throne made of Famicom games, and I sat on it. <laughs> Beautiful. You were the king for the day. It really That's does right. sound amazing. And I really want to go, but the next best thing has happened. The potatoes have come to us, John. Super Potato <laughs> have opened an eBay store with international shimp shipping, so it's now possible to browse the retro goodies and easily import them. If you go and check out the eBay storefront, you're presented with a beautifully sketched... Um, well, stretched, in fact, a beautifully stretched out banner uh, and very compressed banner that looks like it's straight out of the 90s. I, I think that's <laughs> unintentional, to be honest. And all the items seem to be listed with a buy it now or best offer price rather than an auction format. So you can just grab things as soon as you see them, as soon as the impulse takes you. Always a dangerous thing when buying retro. And I've had a cheeky browse, John, just to see if anything tickles my fancy. Have you had a look on their listings? Uh, yeah, I, I, this popped up on my feed as soon as as soon as this went live, uh, and and I've got to admit, prices seem to have risen a little bit in the past decade plus, from what I remember. But I guess that's the way of the video game world. Everything, nothing's getting cheaper out there. But anyway, I had to poke around the website and I chose a couple gems. Now, Neil, you you might know I'm a bit of a Nintendo fanboy, just a bit. Uh, I have a nearly complete collection of black box releases, complete in box, and. Now that I can put that collection to bed, I'm thinking of dipping my toes into the Famicom releases of the same games. Now, of course, the, the NES black box releases were notable for actually containing in-game graphics, where the Famicom boxes, on the other hand, featured stylized drawings that were more common to see on video game packaging back in the day. So, um, just roughly how many NES big box or black box games are there to complete? Uh, I think there's about 25 to 30. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, so it's a these? pretty big. Uh, a... It, you had the uh, you had the initial the initial release of uh, of games in 1985, and then the black box format went all the way through uh, 1987. So I think that uh, Metroid and Kid Icarus were some of the last uh, black box releases. Okay. And are they pretty pricey to collect for? Yeah. The the most valuable ones are uh, you've got the the big box stack up which was uh, sold in very limited quantities because you needed the ROB to use it. Uh, most oh, of the yes. time, Stack Up was included with the, with the NES. And uh, uh, uh Land, uh, which uh, I recently just sold mine uh, to fund some other retro projects, uh, complete in box, I sold it for around $350. So not, not, not a cheap wow. game. No, not at all. Okay, so we've both had a look at Super Potatoes eBay store, and let's compare notes then. The, uh, the top three items that we might want to buy from there... Uh, the first thing that I liked the look of was um, a nice, well, pretty common one, Star Fox. Massive seller. It's the Japanese mm -hmm. version they've got on there, which is boxed. That's going for $50, and um, I just want it for that smooth 60 hertz frame rate compared to what I was used to over here with the 50 hertz. So I, I wouldn't yeah. mind that. What was your first choice, John? 
Uh, I went straight to Balloon Fight because I love the uh, I love the the stylized art on Balloon Fight. Uh, it's just a very evocative of, of the game, uh, and it, they, they're they're asking for cash for this one. One hundred and twelve bucks uh, shipped, or you know, uh, plus shipping uh, for the boxed edition. Pretty pricey. Wow, wow, and that's on the NES, isn't it? Yeah, on the NES. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the next one I picked was also on the NES, and that was Spy v Spy. I don't know if you've played this game. I used to play it on the Amiga, but it was also on the 8-bit, and it was yeah, one, yeah. one of my earliest and fondest memories of early multiplayer gaming. So it was great because you had this you had the split screen you were setting traps for each other and uh you know you were constantly trying to see what your your buddy was doing while at the same time you were trying to accomplish things it was a whole lot of fun yeah there was always the anticipation of i've set the trap are they going to walk into it come on come right. on <laughs> and that's going for 66 dollars um at super potato plus shipping and uh, yeah i just like the idea of playing it on a console and avoiding the load times that i used to experience on my systems um, yeah what's your next I, choice I, I, I went back to the well, the NES well, and, and took a look at Wrecking Crew. Uh, Wrecking Crew is a it's a it's a pretty unique puzzle game where you play as a as a demolition man and you're constantly knocking out walls and things like that. And it's one of the early Nintendo titles to star Mario as a main character, although he's not really named as Mario. He Mario back in the day was just a generic placeholder, <laughs> so uh, they won a lot for that one too. One hundred and ten dollars for the boxed version. Wow, it's a funny name for a puzzle game, isn't it? Wrecking Crew. It, it makes is. me think of like it is. two crew dudes or something, some kind of side scrolling <laughs> beta. But yeah, and speaking of side scrolling beaters, I've gone for the big money for my final choice Final Fight Tough for the Super Famicom, which apparently is the Japanese name for Final Fight 3. And uh, if you want to pick this up, you got to put down 500 big dollars mm, plus shipping. Mm. <laughs> Now, I'm going to leave the NES for my final pick and take a look at some hardware because they do have some hardware listed. Now, this is uh, just just from looking at the, the site here. This is nowhere close to the entire Super Potato catalog. When I was there, I mean, they had stacks and stacks, five or six high, you know, multiple rows of PC engines, etc. So they, they, they're, they're just kind of sticking their toe in the water here with this, this eBay site. But they've got an original Game Boy. Uh, when it was released in its clear edition, uh, which I don't, I'm sure that the the NES or the the American audience, the Western audience, got a clear Game Boy somewhere d- down the line. It might have been in the the the, uh, the Game Boy Pocket edition, but uh, I'd never might seen been, this particular might model. Might even have been the Game Boy Color. Perhaps maybe so, got, maybe so, yeah. yeah. Can't remember. And so, um, but they want two hundred thirty-five bucks for this. Now, now shipping is free on this particular option, so you can save a, a couple bucks that way. But, uh, but yeah, it would be neat to have. I did buy, uh, I and I think I bought this at Super Potato, a Game Boy Light. Did you ever hear of the Game Boy Light, Neil? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was yeah, the this was, down version. This was this was the uh, the version was never released outside of Japan. It's an original black and white or you know green and black screen game boy with a backlit screen um it was very very cool it ran off of i think you know i think this is one of the models where they cut down the battery i think it only ran on one you know double a battery so uh i wish i had kept that uh, it was one of the many things that when i moved back uh to the states from korea i had to let go of but uh it was really cool but anyway this you can get your hands on an original clear game boy for 235 bucks over on super potatoes site Ooh. Nice, nice. So was the light, the Game Boy Light, was it the same thickness as the original? Where they slimmed it down. No, it was sli- it was it was more like a Game Boy color size, yeah. uh, but just just with the backlit screen and without the color. Sounds nice. Sounds like a good compromise. Yeah. yeah. Now, as you mentioned, it's not the full list of stock. It's not the full inventory by any stretch of the imagination. They've got about two hundred and sixty items listed at the time of recording this podcast. So clearly, it's not all three floors of retro. It's mostly Famicom, Super Famicom, N64 stuff, a little bit of PC Engine, with shipping prices to me in the UK showing up as $20. So, And I don't know why it's shown as dollars and not pounds. It's obviously a, a decision they've made on the listings. Mm-hmm. So you're looking at about $70 for the very cheapest box games on there. And um, yes, if you're wondering, the cheapest boxed game on there is a sports game. It had to be a sports game. Uh, it's a game called Barcelona 92 by Capcom, which is... Um, obviously based on the Barcelona Olympics of the same year, 92. And uh, it does actually look pretty good. It looks a lot better than the Barcelona Olympics game I had on my Amiga. Mm. Uh, Very much like track and field with slightly more caricatured big heads on there (laughs) than the athletes. Yeah, kind of the chibi style characters. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I like it. I like it. So, um, but it's worth keeping an eye out on this eBay store, though. Um, 
hopefully I'd like to see some sharp X68000 games appear on there. Maybe even mm. some PC Engine CDs for my collection. They've obviously got a whole lot more that they can get on there. And hopefully if they see visitors, they'll start adding more inventory. So do check the show notes for the links to the store and drop by on our subreddit, subreddit to let us know what you found. Are you looking for a complete range of parts and upgrades for your Commodore 64 or Amiga? Do you need a cap kit so you can finally get that old plus four up and running again? Or maybe now that you're on the cusp of summer, you need a transit card to keep your 1541 safe as you truck it over to the retro expo of your choice. RetroRewind.ca has all that you need and more. Check out their wide array of parts, all assembled on site in friendly Ontario, Canada by Frank himself, who runs the store. And that's not all. Use the promo code TWIR Spring Fun at checkout and save a whole 10% off of your order. A big thank you to Retro Rewind CA for sponsoring today's show. Neil, even as a somewhat casual fan of PC gaming in the late 80s and early 90s, Apogee he hasn't was still... even played Quake. He hasn't I even know. played Quake. <laughs> maybe, maybe not, somewhat casual, casual is, is <laughs> extremely casual fan of PC gaming. <laughs> listen, listen, I'm not going to live that down. I know that Apogee was still a name that I recognize, even though I never played Quake. You know, it, it took us a while to get where you guys, and by us, I mean Americans, where it took us a while to get where you were in the UK with the racks of budget software around the checkout counters of the neighborhood pharmacy. But I distinctly remember seeing racks of Apogee titles, those spinning racks at my local supermarket as a kid. Uh, uh, There was a supermarket called A to Z in downtown bustling Hurricane, West Virginia. Now, Neil, did you ever see an Apogee software rack in, in your local five and dime? You'll have to clear up. Is that an Americanism? Is a five and dime a catch-all for a type of shop, or is that the name of yeah. the shop? Yeah. So a five and yeah, it's it's sort of an antiquated term we still use to represent like a small general store where you can get anything okay. from groceries to a hammer and nails. Uh, but they were originally called five and dimes because everything was five or ten cents. But of course, that's not the case anymore. Maybe maybe you could compare it to something like Poundland in England. Yeah, yeah, okay, I get it, I get it. I can't say I remember uh, racks or pegs of Apogee software being hung in in the stores here. Uh, Maybe it was a thing in the bigger stores in the city, but the corner shops, I guess that would be the the five and dimes. Mm -hmm, Uh, The corner shops in my town, we we had cassette tapes on pegs for our 8-bit micros in the 80s, and then we shifted to the bigger box games. And they tended to move to bigger stores, stationery, stationers, <laughs> chemists, as, as weird as it sounds. But the big box games probably took up too much shelf space on, on a corner store. So they moved away from there and into the high street. And um, we did have games like Rise of the Triad or Terminal Velocity in with the PC games. So those bigger box Apogee games. But the mm-hmm. earlier ones like Commander Keen, I don't remember seeing them outside of mail order listings i don't remember yeah yeah i mean it it was definitely a low budget operation these were these were games i mean almost hearkening back to like the apple II games where they would sell these these three and a half inch floppies in plastic bags with just a label on them saying you know what they were you know commander keen shareware edition three dollars and 49 cents or something like that so it was the first time that i'd I'd seen cheap computer games uh games that were just you know a couple bucks we didn't really have software sold uh, in normal places outside of com- computer stores. And, you know, another contrast with the UK is that we just didn't have the well-developed budget software scene that you guys had. We just did Monte Carlo Casino on R. Sinclair. And, I mean, that came out of the gate with a retail price of two ninety nine. So you had games that were specifically targeted toward that budget price point, which I think is really cool. Um, of course, the reason these Apogee games were priced so low is that they were just shareware compilations. But, of course, I had no idea what that meant. And to be honest, playing games like Raptor and Wolfenstein, even though it was just a few levels, it seemed worth it for the price. You know, if you could get three levels of Raptor for, you know, three bucks, that's that's not a bad deal. It was only later I realized that all of these were available for free <laughs> on the Internet. But in the days of slow dial-up and metered connections, that really wasn't an option for me. So, Neil, what are your early memories of Apogee? Hmm. Just uh, shareware in general. The one time I remember seeing shareware hit a, a big high weight, high street store was, was when Doom came out. That's when I oh, saw yeah. the little, very cheap plastic case with the single disc in there for Doom because mm-hmm. it was such a big deal. Even the big high street stores were getting in on it. Otherwise, right. you had to go to a specialist computer store to look through the shareware discs or mail order. But um, Apogee specifically, 
my early memories of Apogee wouldn't be until I got my first PC. So I hopped on board with the 486 era, about 92, 93. So until then, I'd owned systems that Apogee didn't publish games for. I'm pretty sure they didn't publish games for the Amiga or for the Amstrad CPC. And um, the first I tried was likely to be Wolfenstein because when you get a new powerful PC, the first thing you want to do is is test its limits and see what it can do and make it do things that the machines you had previously couldn't do. And Wolfenstein was an example of that. Um, a little bit later, I moved on to a game called Wacky Wheels. Uh, and that was really my attempt to say to my Super Nintendo owning friends, look, I, we, can, we can kind of do Mario Kart 2 for... <laughs> For, on a piece of hardware that's 10 times the price of your console <laughs> aren't we great um yeah, and it wasn't a bad game it wasn't a bad game but the earlier apogee titles that really founded the company the foundation of the company i can't remember them being in stores mm -hmm. uh, no doubt people in the uk who could afford pcs in the 80s and the late 80s they were probably using dial-up modems to obtain them maybe yeah. through international I, uh, calls but they, i, I, you I know, think that's that's probably true yeah yeah well well thanks for, to a tip off from our intrepid subreddit user pajaco 6502 it looks like apogee is set to make a triumphant return or at least a return. Uh, according to a report in GamesIndustry.biz, company founders Scott Miller and Terry Nagy have relaunched Apogee Software as just Apogee Entertainment, and they've got big dreams of returning the brand to its halcyon days of being the independent publisher of choice for some of the industry's most storied franchises. Now, back when Apogee first launched in 1987, the independent publishers didn't have access to the you know the direct con to consumer platforms they do today. Now. Neil, what do you think Apogee needs to do to attract the best developers, and how can they make their service stand out among all the tall trees like Steam and GOG and what have you? Yeah, it's a very, very different landscape now, isn't it? It's not difficult to self-publish these days. And the attraction way back when Apogee were around first time around was that you could make your game and then you could leave all the hard work to packaging and distribution to Apogee, who would take their fair share, uh, mm -hmm. if not a little bit more, for that service. But these days, you just put your game in Steam or in the Apple Store or where, whatever store you want to put it in. And I remember years back when Windows Phone was still a thing. That's, that was the good one with the Metro interface, not, not Windows Mobile before it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I paid £100, something around £100 for a developer subscription with Microsoft. And that gave me access to the Visual Studio tools that I needed, uh, a little phone emulator so I could test out the software on my PC and the ability to submit the app to a store. So the job of, of publisher is a very different thing these days when you can access right. a you, service you, you like that. You don't really, you don't depend on the publisher to give you distribution. You have distribution worldwide right off the bat with a hundred dollar or a hundred pound developer account. Yeah, I, and I can't remember the name of the app I made. Uh, it was obviously great. I can't remember what I called it. But, um, it was just an experiment to have a go at programming the phone. And it, all it did was it presented you with nine squares and each one you would press and hold to record a sound and tap to play it. So like a little beatboxing. Oh, like a soundboard sort of thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that sort of thing. Um, so that was kind of fun. But I don't know what Apogee are offering to make themselves attractive to developers now, but I suggest the biggest advantage of aligning with Apogee would simply be marketing. Mm -hmm. just, just attaching the game to that name will get it noticed in new stories like this one. We're talking about yeah. it. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. But I, I don't really get what will attract the next new genre-defining Wolfenstein or Doom or, or anything like that to apogee i'd be surprised if they go there and don't self-publish or don't get snapped up by a microsoft or a sony mm -hmm. or someone like that but um you never know john you never know yeah yeah well according to the story uh, in addition to help with marketing they're also offering its developers help with funding uh porting to different devices localization and bug testing which i mean sounds like a pretty attractive prospect i know that uh what developer wouldn't turn down help with all of those things and of course like you said along with the apogee name itself which still carries a certain amount of cachet with gamers of a certain age though for gamers that are you know younger than us in the in the newer generations i don't know how how fondly they remember the name apogee but we'll see uh right now they've already signed deals for their first four games and the first one is uh it's a procedurally generated space survival game it's got a pixel art aesthetic and it's called residual 
Uh, it's going to see release this fall. Uh, I don't know if Apogee is going to veer into retro-inspired titles exclusively to line up with their lineage or not. Uh, they All they've committed to is promoting games with a, quote, fun factor that are easy to get into. So, I mean, that's not the worst idea in the world. I just hope they're able to escape the lure of easy money through games with uh, ads and microtransactions, those idle puzzle-type mm-hmm. games. But yeah, anyway... It doesn't sound like it's genre defining yet. A procedurally generated space survival game. We've we've had them before, John. Right, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but at any rate, you know, I wish them the best of luck, and it will be interesting to see what happens. Yeah. If there's ever a type of story that's guaranteed to capture the headlines, it's those which take something and make it completely impractical. And this is just such a story, John. Sean Buckley over at CNET presented to us this week. The Nintendo Game Man. The Game Boy has grown up, John, and this classic handheld that it kind of almost fit in your pocket. It was a little bit too big, but uh, the later models certainly fit in your pocket. Well, it's grown up and the Game Man is over four times the size of the original Game Boy. That's right. You can have a backpack sized Nintendo Game Boy. Yeah. Sorry, game well, I, you know, I, I figure that it's 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 coming full circle now. We've talked about it a little bit more. My memory has become more clear. the The Game Boy Light was actually a version of the Game Boy Pocket. If you remember the Game Boy Pocket, it was still that original black and white Game Boy, just more pocket sized, and that's what the Game Boy Light was. So it's only natural that if you have a tiny version, why not have this supersized version? <laughs> a massive version, yeah. It's, it's the work of Grumpy Modeler on YouTube who's created, it's actually a 3D printed case, but it's a really nicely finished one. You can't see any stepping or anything on it in his video. Nicely rounded. It really looks smooth and exactly like a Game Boy in all but its proportions, obviously scaled up massively. And uh, as wonderful as this looks, there is a tiny drawback to the size of it. And that's that it makes it really, really difficult to press both the A and the B button at the, mm, <laughs> at the yeah. same time. You know? <laughs> Almost or, like a two-finger operation. Yeah, or in quick, well, two-fist, you've got to just, yeah. <laughs> it's really difficult, really difficult. Uh, technically inside, it's more of a Famiclone than a Game Boy, as it lets you slot in original Famicom cartridges. And um, there's also a TV output. So that's kind of cool. You could have it next to your TV, output into the TV, um, maybe plug a, a Famicom controller in it and sit back on your sofa. Completely de- defeats the point of a Game Boy, but it, look, it would look pretty cool next to your TV. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's how it works. So it got me thinking, John, if you could supersize any console or gaming device, what would it be? Well, but before I answer, I do want to say, I don't know if you remember these, Neil, but there were actually in-store Game Boy displays that were, in essence, kind of what you're describing, what, what Grumpy Modeler has made, which was a, a, a extremely large Game Boy with a screen that would face out non-functional, and then you'd have an actual playable real Game Boy down below it that you would actually be playing on the screen. You would you would look at the, the little Game Boy screen, but then passers-by would see the big Game Boy play in what you were playing. Do you, did you have those in the UK, Neil? I don't remember that stand specifically. I remember we did have a lot of really cool console and handheld stands. I don't remember mm-hmm. the big Game Boy one, but yeah, I yeah, can, I can yeah. fully imagine it. But uh, but for me, I would supersize a Vectrix, you know, without a doubt. Cool. It would be yeah. awesome to see a mammoth 85-inch <laughs> vector screen <laughs> pulsating to life. Although the intensity of the vector beams would probably destroy anybody whose eyes looked at it in like five seconds just because <laughs> yeah. that light would be so intense. <laughs> It would, it would. And uh, just imagine how great those vectors would look and the phosphor glow. Just oh, yeah. Gently, <laughs> yeah, yeah, going on, on such a huge screen, that would be really amazing. Um, I think I'd like to go bigger again, John, and have a building-sized game. Um, <laughs> yeah, maybe something like elevator action just projected on the side of a, a 10-story building and then you work your way down from the top to the bottom. Maybe it could even factor in the windows, you know, a bit of... Uh, augmented reality for <laughs> to, to turn it into a game. That'd be I love it. Cool, I think. Yeah, you'd have to sit back about two hundred meters away to be able to see it all, but um, it'd be worth it. Maybe helicopters would be involved in projecting this thing. We haven't discussed budget, so I'm just going all out. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if you're going to go, go all out. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, the game man is just one of many projects that also highlight the ergonomics. Uh, and why ergonomics is so important in the design process. We've talked about it before with um, various console controllers. The Duke is one that's often brought up on the Xbox, the N64 Mm -hmm. controller. Are there any Mm -hmm. arcades or consoles that you've not just found uncomfortable, but almost unusable because of 
uh, ergonomics, John. Oh, absolutely. I mean, ergonomics are everything. Um, if if you are physically uncomfortable playing the game, then the, uh, what are we doing here? Uh, and and for me, it all the the worst offender by far is the Atari seventy eight hundred controller. I mean, those controllers are so difficult to hold and to use that I find trying to enjoy the system just as it shipped almost impossible which is a shame because the atari 7800 has a bunch of great games um every aspect of that sticks design from the mushy buttons on the sides uh to the unresponsive joystick was one big mistake this is the one that looks kind of like a, a doorstop or a wedge of cheese is that the one right right yeah, right right it, okay it, in a front to god and man neil it's no good <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look good and uh joysticks in general can actually get quite uncomfortable after extended periods in less I find, unless you've got a large base to, to rest your wrist on, it's the same with using a keyboard. I've always got to have desk in front of the keyboard to rest my mm -hmm. hands on. Uh, mm -hmm. There's nothing worse than a, a desk that's not deep enough for the keyboard. I hate it. Yes. Hate it. Um, so they're like an arcade stick, um, like a monster arcade stick. I, that's why I like them, <laughs> because you can rest your wrists on them. And it's taken me a few years to really come to terms with this, but my order of preference for gaming these days is a nice big based arcade stick then a joypad and in last place it's probably a lot of the original joysticks i used in the 80s and 90s like the quick shot pro or the zip stick because i find them intensely uncomfortable to use for long periods of time and it it wasn't always like that i don't know if it was just maybe i had more supple wrists when i was younger mm -hmm. john maybe smaller hands helped i don't know but as i get older i find them more uncomfortable and i do kind of default to an arcade stick or a joypad even though that breaks the authenticity of the experience sometimes it just allows you to enjoy the game more um i agree yeah. I, i'm right there with you i i have a big hoary uh, arcade stick that i use for anything that requires arcade controls and then my my next step is going to be a playstation 4 controller and then finally when i really want to get authentic especially if i'm playing something on on the on the coco or something like that i'll use the uh one of those uh centering self-centering analog sticks with the with the button on the front like the old craft sticks but the way that the button is placed on the front you've got to press it at a weird angle it's just it, it's fun for a couple minutes to bring you back and then you're like okay i'm ready i'm ready to go back to the future now <laughs> yeah yeah i was using a device just going off on a tangent here i was using a device this week on the acorn electron which um it's it's your typical sd card reader that plugs in the back and lets you easily load games but it's mm -hmm. also a joystick port that lets you map keys to the joystick presses because so many oh. games on the electron don't have joystick support so mm -hmm. you can just map it to keys and use a joystick it, it transforms some games uh, that's games great like um blagger yeah it just makes it so much easier to play them anyway back to the game man it, it really is another example of someone showing us what they can do with skill by the bucket load and far too much free time i think on their hands <laughs> so if you'd like to see a massive game boy then check out the links in the show notes Emulating the Amiga can be a real bear. You've got to track down the latest and greatest emulator. You've got to rip your kickstart files from your original machine and then traverse the, uh, let's be honest, sketchy path of wading through the weeds of ROM sites to find all those ADFs you remember playing before all your games were unceremoniously binned when you move away to uni. Well, dear listener, there is another way. Amiga Forever gives you a one-click Amiga solution that works the first time, every time. Everything you need is included, from the latest edition of UAE to officially licensed Kickstart ROMs. It even comes with a full library of games that launch with a single click. But that's not all. New to this edition of Amiga Forever, you can now decompress LHA files from the main menu. That's right, no messing around with the workbench environment at all to play WHD load games unless you want to. To check out all that Amiga Forever has to offer and to download a free demo version, check out AmigaForever.com. We thank Amiga Forever for sponsoring this week's episode. Neil, the retro revival continues apace all over the world. And what is probably timed with the hopeful further relaxation of COVID restrictions, a new retro arcade is opening up in your neck of the woods over in England. Well, I say your neck of the woods, but knowing next to nothing about UK ge geography, uh, is, is Milton Keynes anywhere close to where you live? To an American, I'd probably say yes, because I know that you think nothing of a two-hour drive. But uh, to us Brits, two hours is a big deal. You know, you got you got to make sure the spare tire is pumped up. You got to make sure the emergency pims and the lemonade are securely stowed away in the wicker basket before you set off. 
uh, just in case you run into an emergency, John. So, yeah, about, about two hours. Come on. Come on, Neil. I drive two hours every morning just to pick up milk and a pack of cigarettes. I knew you'd say this. I knew you'd say this. <laughs> so the name of this new arcade is going to be the Pixel Bunker. Hey, I, I think that's a pretty cool name, actually. Yeah, it's pretty um, cool. And, yeah. According to the write-up on MKFM.com, uh, the Pixel Bunker will open as part of an entertainment complex that will house not only the arcade, but a brand new national film and sci-fi museum. So you've got a classic arcade next to a sci-fi museum. Sounds like a match made in heaven to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lot of things in one place. It does sound like my kind of place for sure. It's kind of a, a retro geek pop culture and gaming theme park all in one place. So uh Sounds good, but the arcades appeal to me the most. So tell me a bit more about that side of things, John. Oh, I'm happy to. So what's <laughs> going to be in this new retro arcade? Well, apparently lots and lots of games. Uh, they've got a complete range of machines from the 70s all the way up through the 2000s. And there's going to be a constant rotation of the games on the floor with the games in storage. So according to the article, they have a collection of around 200 cabinets and an additional 150 PCBs. And they actually mentioned that the arcade machines are original and none of the CRT displays have been switched to LCDs. It's that kind of detail that, that tells me as an enthusiast that these guys actually care about what they do and they're not looking to get people in the door with a display of the newest you know, arcade one-up cabinets or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I like that, I like that. Do, do they want to sell any of these cabinets? <laughs> if you're listening and you do, call me, call me. I need some over here. But uh, what's the damage, John? How much will it cost to get in the door? And I'm guessing it's usually a, a free play kind of a deal at these places now. Is that how it's yeah. set up? Yeah, that's how it's set up. This is going to be a play all day for a fee type place. So a single session will run you £13.50, uh, 9 50 for children, or you can get a family ticket for £35. So it's not a bad deal. Uh, what do you think, Neil? Can you see yourself visiting the Pixel Bunker this summer? Yeah, for sure. I should reach out. Maybe they'd like a, a retro road trip so we can try and yeah. get a sort of a behind the scenes look at how they run such an operation. Uh, but £13, that sounds that sounds good. I would easily spend more than that um, in a few hours. You know, I, I was never the best gamer in the arcades, so it wouldn't mm -hmm. take me long to rack up £13 in credits. <laughs> but um, the only thing I would say is that we do pine for the old days of the arcades and the arcade experience. But we also rose tint the experience quite a lot. There's a lot of things about arcades back in the day that I don't want. You know, the sticky floors, the angry guy in the change booth, uh, the constant loop. Maybe this was just my arcade, but the constant loop of King of the Swingers from the Jungle Book on the coin pushers <laughs> just over and over again. It's etched in my mind forever. So I hope that they find a balance of nostalgia, of course, well-maintained and clean machines, and if they're saying there's not going to be any LCDs, it's all going to be CRTs, they've already got that kind of eye for detail by the sounds of it. And good coffee. I know you don't normally think about that with an arcade, but, you know, I'm I'm far, far older than I was when I was that teenage arcade gamer. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost embarrassing, John, but I want a good coffee with my arcade gaming experience, please. <laughs> I am right there with you. I'm right there with you. So the, the Pixel Bunker opens on Friday, the 4th of June, so just about a month, and tickets are on sale now through the, the Pixel Bunker's Facebook page. Uh, thanks to subreddit user Do Communication 855 for making us aware of this story. So, Neil, last week, our community question of the week was, what is your favorite Sega arcade game? Okay, so we're going to read the top three most upvoted responses. We're going to start things off with Psycho Matt. And he says, Daytona! <laughs> surely, surely that was one of your favorites too, Neil. You know, you, you just couldn't help but smile at the attract sound. Uh, oh, yeah. The, uh, <laughs> Let's fly away music on that. Loved it. Um great in my arcade i think it was six might have even been eight cabinets i think it was six wow. cabinets all linked up so yeah we we all went down there uh lunchtime at college and we had the full six player experience on daytona and loved every minute of it brilliant game yeah that was really the first racing game that i remember really pumping a lot of, of money into uh because of the multiplayer aspect there was a uh, a a, a um, an arcade in our in a neighboring town that had a bunch of machines linked up and every weekend we would go out there and play the heck out of them uh, Tricky VFR 800 says, for me, OutRun is the perfect arcade game. Incredible soundtrack, incredible graphics, immersive sit-down cabinet, and supremely addictive just one more go gameplay. Not a hot take by any means, but I'm happy to be Mr. Obvious on this one because the game is just so good. 
Yeah, I agree 100%. Had to be in there, didn't it? it? had to be in there, OutRun. Um, if you've ever watched the OutRun speed run um, videos, it's very odd. I, I think someone even set up AI to work out the quickest route on OutRun, and it's very odd to watch because the car is not even on the road for most of the route. It's sort of off on the grass on one side of the screen and then on the other side. And um, there's obviously a lot of bugs that can be used to your advantage if you want to get a real fast time on OutRun. But I'm mm -hmm. just happy to get past, let's say, stage three. I'm pretty happy if I get past stage three. I have to That's sort of it. where I max out, yeah. Yeah, it gets a bit yeah. tricky after that, yeah. Um, and normally I've got the dip switches turned down to a, a lower difficulty level. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, KLR650 Iowa says, Since you asked for arcade instead of video game, I'll go with Sega's Apollo 13 pin. Great, well-executed theme, fun Lunar Lander DMD minigame, brilliant sound and music, and 13-ball multiball. Holy cow! Have you, tr wow. have you played that one, Neil? haven't is this based on the movie or just the mission? yes yeah yeah okay. so sega had a had a lot of success uh during sort of the second wave of pinball machines that started in the early 90s with these movie licenses i went and looked at a a list of all of their uh all of their you know 90 they basically sega functioned as a pinball publisher throughout the 70s and then the 80s they basically took that decade off and then they came back in the 90s and when they came back in the 90s they licensed a, a bunch of properties everything from apollo 13 to maverick the south park pinball machine i would say is probably their highest selling machine you oh, still yeah. see those around everywhere that. yeah <laughs> all right well everybody our our community question of the week this week is what classic video game would you like to see supersized? So uh, please give us an answer. Head on over to our show subreddit, This Week in Retro, and uh, leave us a response, and we will read the top three most upvoted responses on the air next week. This Week in Retro was presented by Neil from RMC and John Shawler. It was produced by me, Duncan Stiles. The podcast version of the show is available through your favorite podcaster, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And the video version is available on the This Week in Retro YouTube channel. Join our community subreddit at r slash This Week in Retro to suggest and vote on stories we cover on the show. If you watch This Week in Retro on YouTube, please give us a like and subscribe to help us reach new viewers. If you'd like to support the show, please check out the links to our Patreon and Coffee pages in the show notes or in the YouTube description. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week for more up-to-date news for out-of-date tech.